I'll tell you right now that my story doesn't have any dramatic climax or any cathartic resolution. Don't bother reading it, if that's what you're looking for. My story is of one very specific moment in my life, one which, try as I might, I cannot negate as a trick my exhausted brain played on me, or a momentary lapse of reason and subsequent plunge into childish fears. I think a fear of mirrors must be fairly common in this day and age. I remember when I was young I saw one of those compilation TV horror shows, the ones where there'd be a different short scary stories between commercial breaks. In retrospect, it wasn't the scariest thing in the world, and if I saw it again today, I'd probably invite friends over, and we could quash our collective fear by mocking the bad acting or ridiculous storyline. All I remember of it is that, in this story, a man was being constantly tormented by a disfigured, murderous psychopath, but he only saw him when he looked in the mirror. The whole story was a typical song and dance of the man catching a stalker in the mirror behind him, turning to face him and finding nothing there. Maybe the reason I remember it so well is because it was so shortly after I heard my mom die. I say heard because I never saw her body. I was watching TV, a different show, when I heard what sounded like porcelain breaking, followed by a loud thud coming from the kitchen two rooms away. The sudden noise was oddly unsurprising, but I remember craning my head to see my mom's legs sprawled on the tiled floor. I couldn't see any more of her. The door frame was in the way. Luckily, I suppose, my father ran in first, calling her name somewhat frantically. As I stood up, but did not advance out of what I imagined was fear, I remember him telling me to stay where I was. The doctors told us a virus had gotten into her heart. I remember my father protesting that he hadn't even heard of that before. Neither had I, but the concept of death itself was fairly new to me, and I remember being filled with an overwhelming sense of existential fear, as if I or anyone I knew could suddenly crumble into a pile of lifeless dust at any moment. I don't think I was a very fearful child though, not more so than most. And even my uneasiness around mirrors didn't exactly trump my other fears of spiders or being in cramped spaces. I guess it makes sense that mirrors are a source of fear for people. One of the defining signs of self-awareness is whether or not an animal recognizes itself in the mirror. Maybe we still retain some primal belief that what we're seeing really isn't us, but some sinister shadow self. Not to mention all the scenes in horror movies that use them. A character bends down to splash water in their face, and when they lift their head back up, their face is distorted in some gruesome way. I had just gotten home from a party at a nearby frat house. I lived in an old Victorian house that four of my friends from school and I rented. I was the only one home, having left the party early, if you can call two in the morning early, and my roommates were all still out. I ran upstairs to my room. Exhausted and wanting nothing more than to lay in my bed and feel the rest of the world leave me behind. I decided to take a few more steps down the hall to the old, poorly designed bathroom two of my roommates shared with me. It was lit by a single, fluorescent bulb, casting the black and white tile in a sickly, near-green color. I ran a thin strip of toothpaste on my brush and gave my teeth a once-over before spitting the slightly brown spit and foam down the sink. When I looked up, I saw her, standing behind me in the bathtub with the curtain drawn wide open. My mother's mouth hung down as if screaming, but without any sound. I could tell it was my mother, but she was a grotesque shadow of how I remember her. Her eyes were either completely gone or simply black in color. The sockets were vacuums within which nothing reflected. Her skin was so pale it was almost blue, and her dark hair looked drenched in water hugging her scalp tight and falling in front of her shoulders in thin strips. Her mouth wasn't exactly screaming, so much as hanging open, impossibly open, much further than a person's jaw can extend. She seemed to be wearing a thin white nightgown, drenched, like her hair, and clinging to her emaciated body. Her stick legs looked like they were going to buckle under her weight, while her arms reached back against the walls. I must have only seen her for seconds before turning, screaming and falling backwards, slamming hard against the tiled floor. The tub was empty. There had been no sound, and now as the echoes of my cry dissipated, I could only hear my heavy breathing. I don't know how long I lay on the floor of the bathroom. 
the fluorescent bulb dully buzzing as I became too frightened to even move. Eventually, I heard the downstairs door swing open, as a parade of drunk college boys and their floozies poured in for the night. They found me on the floor, and thought it was hilarious that I was so drunk I had almost passed out in the bathroom. I never saw her again. I never want to see her again. And every day I wish I hadn't. There are myths of people being scared to death, or being haunted by dreams of a single event for their whole lives. I've had dreams too, but they aren't what haunts me to this very day. When someone you love dies, you tend to forget everything bad about them, and eventually your fond memories of them just coalesce into a fondness you share with everyone else that knew them. But that's not how I feel about my mother. I was too young to have endless loving stories about her. Instead, all I can remember is her face that night in the mirror. My story doesn't end with me taking my own life, or anything dramatic like that. I have thought about it, though. I tried putting a length of rope across my neck one day and squeezing, just to see what it would feel like, but I would never go through with it. It isn't so much that I want to live. What bothers me the most is that I don't know for sure what happens when we die. Nobody knows, but what I saw that night in the mirror makes me think I do. Alex sat in the cold blue glow of the steel chamber, monitors projecting their indecision between camera views outside a small compound, each switch depicting the bright white of the lunar sands under the floodlight and the unrelenting black of the empty space above. Life in this small research station was similarly dark, oppressively quiet, with nothing but the clicks of recording equipment, inconsistent hums from computer systems and faint clang. The sharp noise from down the hall pierced the envelope of sound that had wrapped Alec in the monitoring room and the startle had his heart thumping up in his throat. The dizzying adrenaline surge started to calm, as he figured one of the backup tapes had probably been vibrated off the shelf by the machinery nearby. Solitary life in the research station had eroded Alex's sense of tidiness, and piles were the easiest sorting method for his work. He turned his attention back to the screens. The white screen to the left was depicting a grid of all camera views in small format. Something on feed 42A caught his attention. 42A, a form of standing below the camera, looking up, motionless, humanoid by the looks of it. What would be the head seemed slightly tilted. Alec brought it up on the center view to get a better look, and felt his stomach twist violently in fear. It was standing still, staring with empty sockets amid a freeze-dried and cracked face of blue skin. It was morbidly recognizable just enough facial features of his late assistant to make him remember the accident, the airlock seal and the guilt, the attempt to bury the evidence, and the endless solitude that had resulted. The tilt, obscenely fatal in its arrangement, was due to a neck fracture that had been sustained when the compartment depressurized. The eyes had burst or shriveled with the change. Alec was never sure. He didn't want to think about it when he had put on his suit and driven the corpse out in the dunes, the direction faced by camera 42A. He had looked at the flash-frozen skin and the horned shapes from the pressure change as little as possible. But now, now he was staring right into the same grotesque death that had decided to come back. Why? And why was the body just standing there, staring, so motionless, so frozen? Frozen? Clang. Frozen. It wasn't standing still. The feed was frozen. The timestamp on the video wasn't moving. It was stuck at 16.25. Alex's fears and mind raced as he looked to the right to check the current clock. 16.40. Clang. The noise. The time. The rest of the feeds. Those that were live. Hadn't shown anything. Alec began to panic. There was an airlock near 42A. One of a pair the sister airlock had been his assistant's coffin. He brought up the access logs noting with dread that all access keypads had been left active, as there had never been anything to keep out. No one knew the codes but the two researchers. 1628. Access granted. Login S. Richards. Code. Inside. It had gained entry 12 minutes ago. No, wait. Not inside. Breathed Dalek with limited relief. There was no subsequent entry for the inner door. It was still in the airlock. The noise must be it beating on the door. 
He knew he had to engage the manual lock, keep it out, maybe it would leave. Summoning up any shred of courage he could manage, Alex stepped out of the monitoring room and turned to face down the sterile metal hallway that ended at the twin airlocks. The black sheen of the thick internal security barrier covered the left entry, while the functional right door sat uncovered, naked and foreboding. The frosted thick plexiglass porthole was empty. No hollow eyes, no broken neck or blue flaky skin staring back at him like with the camera. Just silence and solitude. The silence, the staccato death knell had stopped. Unsure of what this meant, Alec walked towards the door, an undecided pace between hurriedly reaching the lock mechanism and freezing in place with fear. Every step expecting the face, that horrid, cold, unliving face, bent at the wrong angle to reappear in the dark, transparent circle of the door. He finally reached the door panel and with unsteady hands engaged the manual lock. He even dared to peek out the porthole to confirm that it had left. Nothing to see, just the empty airlock and open expanse of sterile lit moonscape outside the external hatch, which sat halfway ajar. A light breeze crept down the hall and stirred Alex and Kemp's hair ever so slightly against the back of his neck as he continued to stare out in fear and disbelief. It dawned on him as he heard the approaching shuffle of ragged boots on the metal planking down the hall. The only breezes in the pressurized facility came from airlock use. Rooted in fear, catching hints of ragged research uniform and broken skin behind his own reflection in the porthole, he began to reach again for the airlock door panel.